Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Sander van der Linden. He is Professor of Social Psychology in the, in the Department of Psychology at the University of Cambridge and Director of the Cambridge Social Decision Making Lab. And today we're going to talk about social media, political polarization, fake news, and science communication and denial, particularly in the context of our current COVID-19 pandemic. So, Dr. van der Linden, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, yeah. pleasure to be on the show. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, great. So, uh, let's start with social media. Do we know if social media in any way alter the way people communicate? Well, I certainly think that if you if you think about, you know, in person communication and the way that you can read other people's emotions and the way that, you know, in, in a way we've evolved to be able to infer intent from other people by looking at their eyes, by looking at how they uh, uh, perceive us by their gestures. And so I do think that online communication over social media has changed the way that people interact with each other. So now we use emoticons to express our uh, emotions, right? Um, it's very difficult sometimes to understand what other people mean. You see this on Twitter a lot, for example. There's a lot of outrage, a lot of anger and debates on Twitter because people misunderstand each other because they don't have the space to be able to express themselves in a nuanced in manner. Um, so I think that, you know, that shapes conversation. So the fact that you can't write more than 140 characters shapes the way that you communicate with someone. Um, you know, we've, we've done research, in fact, on what happens on some of these platforms. So we have a paper that's about to come out in PMES that was led by one of my students. And we looked at millions of data points on Facebook and Twitter from US congressional accounts, but also media accounts. And, you know, one of the later kind of common findings at the moment is that, you know, language that's very moral and emotional is more likely to go viral. And so that's also what we find. But in addition, what we found, and this is really interesting, is that you know basically negative talk about the other group? So if we go things as you're a liberal, you're a Republican or a conservative uh, uh, and Democrat, um, what happens is that people, the more you know, you basically talk in a in a derogatory tone about the other group, the more you're retweeted and the more it's liked, um, and that's really interesting. And that and that's above and beyond the effect of emotion and morality. And so negative sort of outgroup talk is really what's driving engagement on these platforms and that's what we find and so we're wondering if the incentive structure of social media is actually just pushing people into negative ways of interacting with each other and it's difficult to say whether it, you know you can't do a controlled experiment by putting half the population on facebook and the other half you know offline so it's difficult to say in causal terms what's causing it but certainly i would say that you know online media particularly social media, has fundamentally changed the way that people interact with each other. Um, and also on, on different levels, you know, it's um, the last thing I'll say is uh, think about um, how people perceive themselves and, and how we think about ourselves. If you tweet somebody and nobody likes it, does that hurt your self-worth, your self-esteem? Do you feel people not included, people not liking your content? You know, what's the equivalent of a, of a like or a click? You know, if somebody gives you a compliment in person and they say, oh, Ricardo, such a nice podcast, you know, I love listening to it, um, you know, it makes people feel good. Um, is that psychologically, is that the equivalent of somebody liking your podcast on Twitter or is it different? And so I think, you know, there, there are a lot of interesting questions there about how social media is changing the way that people uh, interact with each other and how it affects us. Mm -hmm. uh, that last part, it's very interesting. So are you saying that we don't know yet if, for example, me getting a like uh, has the same psychological effect as getting a compliment in real life? Exactly. Yeah, I don't know if we know what the psychological equivalent of an in-person compliment is. Is it one like, ten likes, a hundred likes? Uh, and also downward comparisons is if somebody says something, you know, not so nice to you, uh, is that the same as a as a uh, you know an angry an angry reaction to a post or somebody not liking your post? I think these are all unanswered questions, and it's surprising because we engage with social media so much that we should really be looking into how it affects us. I know there's I have colleagues who do a lot of research on the mental health implications of social media, you know, and they say, oh, it's not so not so obvious really that spending more time online is bad for your mental health. In fact, you know, a lot of the research is difficult to do because it's all correlations and, um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's uh, small studies and the larger studies over time actually show that, you know, it's not, you know, it can also have positive effects on people's mental health. So that's, that's a, it's, it's a difficult question, but I think we need better tools to investigate it. And one of the key challenges is that we don't have access to the social media data, right? So the social media companies, they can do their experiments internally, but, but we can't. We can, we can only simulate it for people or gather public data, which severely limits what we can say about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So that applies both to the positive and the negative effects that social media might have on people, right? Because, I mean, nowadays we hear a lot of people talking about the negative effects, effects that social media might have particularly in adolescents and young people and how it might affect their self-image and could drive th things like depression even, but uh, we don't have enough data to uh, have some sort of saying on those matters or definite saying. Yeah, absolutely. We don't have enough causal data, I think, from proper interventions. Uh, and and you, can, you can ask whether it's even ethical to try to do that, but that, you know, it does limit what we can say. And um, certainly, there there are instance, instances of, of people who for whom social media has led to very negative things about their own mental health. The question is whether those anecdotal experiences from people around the world add up to a real causal explanation. And I think that's that's people have been skeptical about that. Um, and so, yeah, in the mental health domain, I think it's difficult to say at the moment. I think the consensus is that there is a negative correlation, but it's very small and it's different for different age groups. And then maybe it matters a lot, you know, what your own mental health state is before you come onto the social media platform, right? There could be an important interaction that it has negative effects if you're already not doing so great. Um, uh, but then again, for some people, it might be a support group, right? You can find support groups online. It could be positive. You know, I joined social media initially because of, 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 of my ability to stay in touch with people around the world. And I think, you know, a lot of these companies designed these systems as a, as a way to for people to connect uh, and the power of connection and, and keeping people in touch. And I think that was not a bad idea, but I think what was bad that we, I say we, but maybe the people who designed these companies did not foresee all of the different ways in which their technology could be used, misused, and they did not test what effects it has on people's uh, psychology before they put it out there. And I think that's a, a new insight that I think people often ask me, what would I recommend? And I think one of the things to recommend with any new kind of technology like this is that we need to test its effects on human psychology before we, we put it out there and let people interact with it. Because, you know, it is true. And we're, we, we've talked about mental health and I'm sure we'll talk about this more later. But, you know, when it comes to echo chambers, disinformation, fake news, there are a lot of bad things that are happening on social media. And, you know, Everyone's talking about the bad stuff, but I realize there's also positive things about social media. Um, and so that's we should definitely recognize those as well. But um, yeah, on the whole, it's, it's difficult to say. Mm -hmm. But are there things about how we interact with people in normal, let's say, real life settings that would also apply in, in online settings? Like, for example, the way people form perceptions about their social world? Well, there are things that might be somewhat similar in the sense that, uh, you know, if, if a lot of people around you think or believe something, you're more likely to adapt that belief as well. And this is something we call social consensus and people are susceptible to that. And for good reason, because, you know, there's a, the classic experiment that if you put 10 people down the street all looking up at the sky and you watch bystanders go by, um, you can see that people start looking up almost as a function of how many other people uh, are waiting on the street at the end. If there's only one person, people don't take that as an important cue. But if you put 10 people, 15, 20, 50 people, all of a sudden now social consensus becomes important. And, and that makes sense because it's a simple heuristic. It doesn't cost you anything. If aliens are coming down, you want to know about it, right? Uh, and so um, you, you, you might wonder what's going on. Um, the same principle happens on social media, that if everyone's talking about something, if everyone likes something, if everyone's sharing something, there's a form of social consensus and you are susceptible to that. Um, and so I think there are similarities there, for example. Um, but, but there are also uh, differences in, in, in that, I think on social media and the internet, you have the ability to express yourself with more anonymity. So people might feel emboldened to say things 
that they wouldn't in person. Because you are more distant, you might also challenge people more directly and say more negative things because there are less consequences for you. Uh, if you challenge somebody on Twitter or Facebook, you're shouting at them, you're saying something negative, what's going to happen? Uh, it's all virtual. Would you do the same thing in person, right? Uh, uh, probably not, because there are a lot of other circumstances. Um, so I do think that there's very important differences, uh, uh, whilst there are also some similarities, like general effects of, of social consensus. If we talk about echo chambers, people form echo chambers offline too, right? It's not just a social media phenomenon. I think that's something that's often missed. There's a really fascinating research that shows that even offline, Democrats and Republicans cluster together. Uh, and even in, let's say, suburbs of New York, you can see that Democrats uh, cluster together in the same neighborhood more than Republicans and so on. So you can see that, that segregation on a very fine-grained neighborhood levels, uh, and that has nothing to do with social media. Um, and so, you know, there, there's, there's offline echo chambers too. So that's, that's you know, that's not new. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's important to talk about these differences and similarities. But are echo chambers a big problem? Um, well, that's a, it's, a, it's a good question. So I think that the big question for computational social scientists has been how, how do you define an echo chamber and what are the consequences? And, and there's not been a clear consensus on either of those questions because um, I think often what you see in the debate on is are there echo chambers, how important is it, is that people use different definitions of what an echo chamber is. Uh, and also they talk about different layers of, of consequences. So I think there's some consensus that two ingredients of an echo chamber are one, that in, there's a bias in the flow of information towards like-minded others. So if you, if you look at cascades in social media, what you'd see then is that people share more stuff with like-minded others versus people who are more diverse. So you would see a, a bias in the flow of information. And the result of that is expected to result in polarization, which is not always a um, outcome that is necessary, but often you do see it that as a consequence of that bias information flow, people drive further apart, are being driven further apart, and so they become more polarized. Um, and so that's kind of the, the way that they try to map these echo chambers, that, okay, we see that um, people segregate into uh, into different clusters uh, and they share information in different ways, which leads them to um, you know to, to, to become polarized. Uh, and so, what what is the effect of that? Um, well, polarization, of course, is 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 one effect, and so that's what people think it's bad because it, it drives people further uh, apart. And uh, Cass Sunstein wrote about this in in uh, in one of his early books uh, almost 20 years ago. Um, because there's a, an offline phenomena in, in which you can show this pretty well. Uh, it's basically an experiment that if you put people in, 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 in one group and you have them talk about um, a controversial topic, let's say uh, climate change, abortion, uh, um, and, you know, anything in the United States that's contested, gun control, um, and you put people together in a room that all have the same opinion. So all the people who are anti, uh, let's say anti-gun control, and then you put people in another room that are all pro, program control interventions. Um, you let them talk to each other without the two groups separately, right? So they can't interact. And then you go back and you find that they've become more extreme in their opinions because they've been talking to people with the same attitude. So now they've become convinced to go more anti and more pro and the end result is polarization. So again, it's not, it's not exclusively online, um, but that's the danger of echo chambers that they, I think that's one consequence that this sort of um, a belief polarization. Um, but the other danger is how it affects the flow of uh, misinformation in the network. And so what happens is that, um, let's say bad information is out there, there's misinformation about the coronavirus out there in, in, um, in you know, online, and you want to issue a correction. So, you know, you say, okay, you know, uh, I'm Ricardo, I'm a fact checker, um, I'm going to disseminate lots of factual information. What happens is because the structure of the echo chamber is that the, the fact check will only reverberate uh, amongst audiences who already engage with that type of content and it won't reach the other side of the echo chamber, right? It won't cross into a different echo chamber. And so it, it halts the spread uh, of information because the flow of information is biased uh, within the echo chamber. And so one annoying 
quote unquote annoying consequence for fact checkers is that it limits uh, the way that you can debunk and actually correct things because it, it gets stuck in the echo chamber. And that's kind of, you know, two, two consequences of echo chambers that are uh, problematic. Uh, there's a whole side range of consequences that I think that are more indirect, you know, trust in each other, trust in society, trust in media. It might, you know, sort of sow distrust. Um, it can perpetuate stereotypes about other groups of people. Um, and prejudices, and so there, there's a whole range of more indirect sort of consequences. Um, but that's kind of the case, you know, of, of why it's bad. And then there's the people who say, oh, it's not, it's not a problem. Um, and you know, that, that's a whole more technical discussion. So Facebook published this paper a while back, and I say Facebook because there were mostly Facebook scientists on this paper. It was published in Science Procedures Journal. A lot of people quote this, and they say, oh, oh, uh, echo chambers and filter bubbles are, are not a big problem. Um, and, you know, the paper is interesting, but I think we should be aware of its limitations in the sense that uh, filter bubbles and echo chambers are slightly different, right? The filter bubble is exclusively about the algorithm, so that based on your digital footprint, it recommends things to you um, that jive with what you already believe. And so, you know, based on things that you've liked in the past, they give you more content that you like and so on. And um, it can interact with the echo chamber in the sense that it can it can cause you to fall into an echo chamber and so on. But um, what what's interesting about that paper is they make so they looked at, at millions of data points on on Facebook, and basically what they say is that um, you can think of it as a, as different stages. So initially, the amount of diversity you have in your network is up to you. How many friends do you have from the other side in your network? That is your potential to be exposed to alter alternative viewpoints, right? And they say that's that's up to people. So you know, let's assume that people have a certain structure like that. So they say you know let's let's assume that it's it's pretty random that it's like 50-50. Um, then you don't have much of an echo chamber, right? But but they say if you look at reality, you do see that Republicans and Democrats kind of cluster together in terms of their network. So there's there's a bit of heterogeneity, but mostly they're they're, they're pretty separate. Um, and then there is um, what they call the the filtering algorithm that they use. And their question is, how much does this reduce your potential to be exposed to diverse content? And so what they do in the study is they try to calculate this by looking at what their algorithm does, and they find that it it does reduce your potential to be exposed to diverse news, political news, a, a little bit, um, but just a few percentage points. And they say, you know, ultimately, um, um, what happens in the next stage, though, is what people actually click on. So basically, they say, look, we have this algorithm. It limits your potential a little bit by keeping you, you know, by, by sort of biasing you towards content that you already agree with. But then it's up to you what you click on. You don't have to click on stuff that we don't recommend. Um, and uh, what happens is that, that people just choose to, uh, not to click on diverse content most of, most of the time. And so their conclusion is, look, it's not us, it's you. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's very interesting because it doesn't take into account the fact that um, the algorithm, so people's recommend, so the recommend, what you click on is not independent of the recommendations, right? What you ultimately click on is, I think, very much influenced by what the algorithm is showing you. Um, it's also based on a data set that was completely restricted to people who self-declared their ideology on Facebook, which might be a very particular kind of sample. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't include targeting and things like that. So you know, I, I think I think they're partially right that there's choices that people make, and that the the algorithm itself isn't you know the end all and be all of uh, of what people do. Uh, but it it sounded to me like they're not taking responsibility for for their role in um, in the echo chamber process. And then the other people who've critiqued it sort of say it's you know it's most people are not ideologically extreme. And um, most people don't share hyperpartisan content. And so what they're saying is that the echo chambers tend to revolve around extreme partisans who are engaging in hyperpartisan news sharing. And so echo chambers are kind of restricted to subparts of the population who are more, you know, who are extremely politically involved. And so we shouldn't worry about it as much. Which, you know, I think these are all decent points, but I don't think it takes away from the issue that there's a big problem.
Mm -hmm. So, but are echo chambers a partisan issue in any way? Is it that, for example, conservatives are more prone to forming echo chambers than liberals or vice versa? Yeah, I mean, this is a very contested uh, uh, research space. In fact, a space that's become politicized in itself um, because you're making conclusions about political, of the psychology of political groups. Um, and so I should preface that I found that it's a very interesting field of, uh, of research. Um, look, I think that there, that there are things that there's a tradition in psychology, a history of investigating psychological differences between liberals and conservatives, mostly done in the United States, but not exclusively. You know, I'm originally from the Netherlands, so I know that the liberal conservative distinction it works, but it doesn't map onto the Dutch political system entirely. We have people in the Netherlands who are conservative, but would vote for left-wing policies because it's just much more nuanced and complex. I'm not sure how, how it is in Portugal, um, but you know, and certainly in Europe, uh, we have populism too, obviously, uh, and we have this distinction. But you know, because we have multi-party coalitions, things are slightly bit slightly different. Um, so a lot of this research is done uniquely in the U.S. and maybe the Commonwealth. Uh, um, and what they find is that there are important psychological differences between liberals and conservatives. And one of those differences that seems to be pervasive, regardless of what theory you look at. So if you look at John Joe's systems justification theory, uh, Jonathan Haidt's moral foundations, you know, if you look at all of these these different political psychologists, there is this tendency that conservatives value in-group loyalty um, or um, within group consensus more than liberals in the sense that they care about the closer unit um, of their own family and their own friends. They tend to be more concerned um, with their own sort of echo chamber in the sense that uh, uh, now people like Jonathan Haidt would say, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different way of, of viewing the world. There's other psychologists who say, well, there's a lot wrong with that because you're valuing your own people over people you don't know. And, and, and that, that's philosophically, that's, it's not clear that that is an ethical preference that one should be taking. Um, and so, you know, there's an interesting debate there. Um, but basically, um, this, this effect we have also found in our research. For example, um, we find that uh, uh, Republicans are, are more likely uh, to, uh, you know, endorse conspiracy theories or misinformation uh, and spread it, uh, particularly about uh, COVID-19 and, and other issues. Uh, um, but, but even at a level of, of conspiracy uh, mindset, so not, not about any specific issue, just a general mindset, um, um, seems to be higher among extreme conservatives. And I should say, I, I, it's very important to bring some nuance to this, is that uh, Richard Hofstetter has a, has a book called the, the Paranoid Style of American Politics. And I think this is, this is kind of a slightly unique situation to the U.S. That in the U.S., people have been paranoid for a long time about other groups of people, whether it was the, the Red Scare and the communism, Mormons, uh, um, uh, Jewish people, um, immigrants. There's been a long history of, of paranoia and politics about the other threat, uh, which which has very been deeply ingrained into the ideology that causes a sense of paranoia and, dis and distrust. And we find that this mediates the effect. So it's, it's that yes, conservatives uh, are more likely to sort of be in a conspiratorial mindset, um, but its effect uh, is is mediated by you know distrust in institutions, distrust in media, mainstream media, uh, and a greater sense of, uh, uh, of of kind of general paranoia about things um, on you know on um, uh, conspiracy theories, and so that's 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 kind of um, one explanation. Um, but that doesn't mean that liberals cannot endorse conspiracy theories. Clearly, liberals and Democrats can also endorse conspiracy theories. Uh, we know that, uh, 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 you know, one of the Kennedys is a prominent anti-vaxxer. Um, um, and so, you know, it, that's not what we're saying. But if you look at uh, the extremes in ideology, you see that clearly there is there is some tendency for people who are more extreme in their ideology to be more likely to endorse extremist beliefs and conspiracies. But there's a uh, an asymmetry such that it's, it's more prevalent among the right. And one explanation uh, 
that I think is useful to take into account here is that um, it also depends on the issue domain a little bit. So uh, what's also unique about the conservative worldview is a sense of freedom, independence from government intervention, free market ideology. So any science which has implications for how people lead their lives is going to be politicized. If that science doesn't speak to the ideals of the left, you will see more objection there. If it doesn't speak to the ideals of the right, you will see more objection there. I think what we've seen lately though with climate change and COVID, most of the solutions are about restricting your personal freedom. You have to stay inside. Um, you can't do what you want. We're going to intervene with the free market here. Lots of government regulation, uh, businesses are suffering. So what you see is that the science is antagonizing everything that the right values uh, at the moment. And I think that's why you see more misinformation sharing, more conspiracies, more objections from the uh, political right uh, among a lot of these issues. Uh, um, so again, anti-vax is can be on the right, but there is also some interesting left-wing uh, herbal medicine, alternative medicine kind of denial that, uh, that's, that's intertwined with, with anti-vax, for example. Um, and so I think it's a nuanced uh, story, but objectively, we have to be objective. If you look at the data, then uh, chan news channels in the United States, like Fox News, um, studies have shown that they have been spreading more misinformation about the pandemic early on when they were broadcasting news. Um, if you look at the echo chamber effects that we've been talking about, there are more pronounced uh, and denser on the political right. So again, doesn't mean that Democrats don't have echo chambers, it's that they're slightly more diverse than the Republican echo chambers. They're more dense, they're more tightly knit, probably because they care more about that sort of psychological effect, and that has implications for the bias flow of information. That's also why you see that more misinformation is being shared uh, and rotated. Uh, because of that effect. So it's a long-winded answer, but hopefully that's somewhat satisfactory. Yeah, of course. Uh, when it comes to fake news, is it that lots of people share fake news or it's only a minority of people that do so and, and they share most of fake news out there? I mean, I'm asking you that because recently I've read an article talking about uh, content creators that disseminated misinformation about COVID-19 online and I, I'm not sure what the country was, I think it was the United States, it was half a dozen or, the, or a dozen of these content creators that put online the misinformation surrounding COVID-19 and then, I mean, other people shared, so. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, uh, this is another uh, very good question. Um, I think there's two questions actually. I think one one is, is it only a minority of people who are sharing fake news or, or falling uh, for fake news, which are actually two slightly different things. And then is fake news a problem? And I think it's interesting because even if the answer is yes to the previous question, that only a minority of people are believing or sharing fake news, I think that doesn't automatically mean that it's not a problem. Uh, okay. uh, but let me, let me tackle the first one. I think yes. First, it's important that the latest research has shown that actually there's a difference between sharing fake news and being susceptible to fake news. So um, a lot of research shows that a minority of people share fake news, um, but that doesn't mean that lots of people are not susceptible to fake news, right? And so it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic. So yes, if you look at big social media studies, so look at during the 2016 presidential election, COVID-19, um, they look at public social media data, right? So it's not necessarily all social media data, but from what we can see, it appears that minorities of people are sharing the majority of the fake news. Um, and they call these people super spreaders. Um, you see that on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook. So who are these people? They tend to be people who are more politically active, people who are more extreme in their ideologies, often on the right, um, and people who are older, but sometimes younger. It kind of depends on the issue domain. Um, and um, people who spend a lot of their time on the internet. And so it, it um, you know, uh, it is the case that uh, most people don't share a lot of fake news. Um, so I think that is that is a good assessment. Now, I do think that pretty much everyone is susceptible to fake news. Uh, um, and there are some, some reasons for that that have to do with how the brain works. Um, 
and that means that if only a minority of people who share fake news, if that gets amplified by by influencers, governments, media, um, other people, it goes viral. That means still a very large amount of people could be exposed to it. Um, and we know that because most people are susceptible, that can still have important consequences. So why are most people susceptible? I think um, what we know is that from lots of research, uh, there's something called the illusory truth effect, which is that um, the more you are exposed to a falsehood or information in general, the more likely you are to think it's true uh, because the brain mistakes familiarity for fluency. So if something is uh, familiar to you, it becomes more fluid in the brain. Uh, so the, the more you hear something, automatically the brain seems to imbue it with some sort of um, signal that it's more likely to be true because you know you're familiar with it. You know, two times two is four. That's a useful heuristic for the brain to have because you don't want to do the calculation each time. You've heard it many times, so you're more likely to think that that's the true answer. Unfortunately, when it comes to falsehoods, it works the same way. Um, and that's why it's also difficult partly to get rid of it because we know that even when people acknowledge a correction or a debunk, um, they continue to retrieve false details from memory. And this is called the continued influence of misinformation that once we're exposed to it, it makes friends in your memory, it links to other things you know, and the longer it sits, the more it ingrained it becomes, and so the more difficult it is to correct. Um, and so um, because of these basic sort of cognitive principles, we know that everyone's susceptible to fake news. It's not just old people. So there's some research papers that show that oh, older people share more fake news, which might be true. Uh, but there are also studies, for example, by um, Sam Weinberg's group at Stanford that show that, you know, Kids and teenagers have difficulty differentiating sponsored content between between sponsored content and, and real news, right? And so it's it, it's I think it's everyone. I've been duped by fake news, and I study it. Uh, and so you know I, I think uh, and in fact there are papers by Lisa Fazio, uh, who is a colleague, who shows that expertise doesn't necessarily protect you from illusory truth. So the idea that even when you know, when you tell people, um, and I think this is an interesting example. I think it was. Um, What's the skirt that Scottish men wear? Uh, and so um, they were told uh, the right answer, but then repeatedly exposed to a false answer. And they find that even though when people have been told the correct answer, they continue to retrieve the false details from memory, uh, right? And so knowledge doesn't necessarily protect us from it. And so that's why I think it's true. A minority of people are sharing most of the fake news, um, but I think everyone's ultimately susceptible to it. Um, and that's why I think it's still a, a big problem. Mm -hmm. Does the sharing of fake news have anything to do with people uh, signaling their belonging to a particular political group, for example, like their political party or the political poll they identify with? Because I, I was imagining that perhaps it, uh, this could not be really an issue of fake news versus real news, but of people sharing either of these types of news just to signal online their belonging to their particular social political group or whatever yeah absolutely i mean that's a that's a that's a possibility so there's this big debate more generally on on the motivations behind why people share and fall for fake news and maybe we can get into this later i think we, we have a, a special definition of, of fake news that, that we are concerned with which is not doesn't have to do so much with the fake real distinction, but more about degrees of, of media manipulation. Um, but in, in general, there is what uh, Gordon Pennycook and David Rand call the uh, the inattention account. And, and they're mostly arguing that it's not politics, it's that people are just not paying attention because of the way that social media shapes our attention. So they're saying it, it directs our attention away from accuracy. And when you nudge people to be accurate, you know, they're they're sharing less fake news, and so they're they're mostly saying it's a, you know, it's based on the fact that people have limited cognitive bandwidth and they're overwhelmed, and so it's it's inattention, it's not some political motivation. Then there's people saying, you know, that's complete nonsense, more or less. It's it's that people are politically motivated, and they share fake news that's congruent with the beliefs and ideologies of their political group, and it's just another way for them to express who they are, to express their identity. And I think this is part of what what you were saying here. Um, and I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. Um, I think it's uh, completely implausible to think 
that accuracy is the only thing that's that's on people's minds. Uh, uh, I think there are a lot of things on people's minds but besides accuracy. We have different motivations. We have social motivations. We have political motivations. But we also have accuracy motivations. And it depends on how we prioritize those at any given moment. And when something is political, or when you put people on the spot about something social or political, I think it's more likely that people will share fake news because they want to express their social identity or their political identity. But uh, when you're in a, in a more general situation, I think those are less priorities and it might just be that people have been mistaken or they are not paying attention and they just share stuff because you know they see other people sort of share it or their which, which is still kind of a social consensus effect actually but um or, or maybe they didn't read the article before sharing it right so think before you post sort of thing um and so ultimately i think it's complex i think all of these motivations play a role in why people share and and believe in fake news and i think a theoretical account actually that incorporates all of these different facts is going to be much more powerful than, than the, just the either or explanation. Because you see the field actually quite divided that, oh, it's just inattention and, oh, it's just politics and motivations. And I think the, the real answer lies somewhere in between. And clearly, people are motivated by um, sharing news that reaffirms their identity, uh, but not always. And that doesn't mean that they don't care about accuracy. So I think there's, there's room for both explanations. Mm -hmm. But the explanation certainly isn't that people who share fake news are, just to oversimplify things, stupid, right? Because, I mean, I'm asking you that because I have lots of contact with uh, science communicators because of what I do, and it's very easy for them to get uh, annoyed about people sharing fake news, particularly now with the COVID-19 situation, and for them to say that people share fake news because they are stupid but is that a good explanation yeah and so again you know i think this partly comes out of the fact that our colleagues like uh, penny cook and rand have articles that are that with the headline uh lazy not biased um and what they're saying is that the people are not biased by their politics are just lazy um I, I don't think they use the word stupid because they want to be a bit more politically correct. They don't think people are right. stupid, but they think they're not paying attention, right? Um, I think um, my view is that um, it, it is true that at least on a correlational level, we also find that people with the lowest numeracy skills, with the lowest science literary skills, with the lowest education levels are more likely to share fake news. Uh, so there is a, some sort of relationship between how discerning you are in your cognitive abilities uh, and how much you share fake news. But I can't possibly imagine that that's the only explanation, right? And so um, I don't think it's that people are dumb. I think that people might well be aware of, of, of what they're doing sometimes and that there's other motivations that play a role, like, you know, when they express who they are. Sometimes there's some papers show people share fake news because they think it's funny um, or, you know, you want to participate in the rumor mill. Um, and so I think there's, there's lots of uh, expressions that could underlie um, why people um, share fake news. But here's an important thing to consider, maybe. Um, some some people think of the the human brain as a as a Bayesian updater, right? So you have a, a prior belief about the world, and you come to the to the table, and you you encounter a piece of evidence, and then a, a purely Bayesian scientist brain would say, "I'm going to update my beliefs towards the evidence," uh, and 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 you know that's that's how I go about the world. Uh, but often, what you see, or what people think they see, is people have a prior belief. And they come in contact with a piece of information, and now they're updating in the wrong direction, or they're denying the evidence. And so the, the, the brain must not be Bayesian, right? It must be doing something else. It's the motivated brain. It's not the Bayesian brain. I think actually, though, there is some interesting work that shows that you can all incorporate these explanations in a Bayesian brain context. So maybe what's happening is that, you know, people have prior beliefs. For some people, these prior beliefs are not very strong. So when you come into contact with facts and evidence, you update a bit more towards that evidence. But if you're an extreme individual, your prior is going to be very strong. And you're going to be updating less. You're still moving in the right direction, but you're you're you know you're less flexible in your thinking, so you're going to update less. And sometimes, what we see is that you think that people are updating, that people are not sorry. You think that people are not updating. And because of that, they must be stupid. So you say, okay, here's the evidence, here's the facts. You know, you're not updating, so you must be stupid. 
So there's two ways we can evaluate this. One is, no, it's just that you have a very strong prior belief of what you think is true about the world. You could say, well, that prior belief doesn't make any sense. Or, and here's the interesting thing, this is what Jamie, my colleague Jamie Druckmann calls the observational uh, um, um, paradox, uh, or the uh, uh, observational equivalence paradox, is that when we observe it, all of these explanations can be true at the same time. We don't know. It's kind of Schrodinger's cat, um, right? And so we, we not do the experiments to try to tease them apart. Here, here's, I think, what's, what's the interesting part. It could be that you think the credibility of the facts that are presented to you is low. So it's not that you're stupid. You're thinking, I don't trust the New York Times. I don't trust NPR. I don't trust the government. I don't trust the WHO. And so you think the credibility of that piece of information is low. And that's why you're not updating. So when you look from the outside in, it could be that, you're, that we're confusing some sinister motivation uh, with actually a Bayesian understanding of, of updating towards based on the credibility of the piece of evidence that's presented to you. Um, now the question is, a lot of these sources could be high, high, have high credibility and people are not judging it accurately, right, because they have a motivation. So it's not ruling it out. Um, but I think often what you see is that we, we forget that people might have been exposed to an echo chamber where they're constantly being told what the good sources are, what the bad sources are. They're selectively exposed to information. So it's perhaps no surprise that people think that, you know, content from certain outlets are not credible. And so it's not that they're dumb necessarily. Uh, it's, you know, people say, okay, well, you know, they should have looked elsewhere. They should use their brain actively to try to find diverse viewpoints. And I think that's what's annoying people. But, you know, people are, people are busy. People are doing different things. So, can, you know, to the extent you can blame people, I think it's, it's, it's different. It, it's, it's difficult. Now, if you're, if you're trying to say it's not that people are dumb, people know exactly what's going on with the evidence, they're deeply socially and politically motivated to share content um, uh, that upholds their beliefs of their group, I think that's, that's not always true. I think it's true for the people who are more extreme uh, and have extreme attachments to political groups and social identities, but I don't think that that's the single explanation uh, for for most people, but I think it, it's part of the explanation. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, it makes sense. So mm -hmm. with all of this in mind, do we have any good scientifically validated strategies to prevent uh, the sharing of fake news? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I mean, we've been I've been spending years on, on trying to uh, counter misinformation and there, there's different approaches that I think all have some some use. Um, there's been this big debate about debunking um, and how well that works. There was a big scare among fact checkers and, and, and other organizations that debunking was dangerous because um, it can backfire in the sense that uh, you repeat the, the myth and so people become more entrenched on it as part of the, as part of the fact check. Uh, and in fact, uh, what happens is that uh, you know, people become more polarized or, you know, they, they, they update away from the facts because you're repeating the, the misinformation as part of the fact check and, and this is called sort of a, a backfire effect. And there's different kinds of backfire effects. Um, but it turns out that, you know, communicating facts doesn't usually backfire with people. People can say, thanks, I'm not interested. Or they could say, okay, I can, I can see the facts, but I'm going to still, you know, hang on to some of my beliefs. Um, but the backfire thing where people actually now run away from the facts in the opposite direction, that's, that's quite an extreme reaction. Most people are not doing that. So we've, we've updated our, uh, in, in the latest debunking handbook that was done with, with 25, authored by 25 different misinformation scholars that we've done for practitioners, we've updated the consensus on that, that it's probably okay to debunk now. I think the risk is, is, is fairly low. Um, but still, fact-checking and debunking doesn't work as well, even without this dramatic backfire effect. Let's say that that's not occurring. There are still reasons for why it's not the most effective. One is that we've talked about this a little, the continued influence of misinformation. Once people are exposed to a falsehood, even when people acknowledge the correction and they're fine with it, they still continue to retrieve false details from memory. A fact check or a debunk forces you to use the frame of the original misinformation, obviously, and so you are repeating it um, often, which is not, not desirable. Um, and the third is that, you know, famous quote that, um, you know, while a lie makes its way around the world, the truth is still getting its pants on. 
fact checks are just often too little too late and they don't reach the uh, the necessary amount of people compared to the original misinformation. Doesn't mean fact checks are bad. I think, you know, Brandon Nyhan, political scientist, has done some research on, on incentive signaling. So it, it signals to politicians and people that there are others out there checking you, which I think is just a useful incentive to have to make sure that people are aware that if you're going to lie, somebody's going to call you out. I think that's useful, even though it's not perfectly effective. I think it's all useful. Having said all of this, we have been going and trying to invent a new way of trying to do this. Uh, which we call pre-bunking, which is the opposite of debunking. And one way to pre-bunk is through the theory of psychological inoculation, which is a theory from the 60s that people are kind of forgotten about, where initially people were kind of experimenting with this idea of, you know, is it possible that just as with a vaccine, when you inject people with a weakened dose of the virus and they generate uh, antibodies to help confer immunity against future infection, can you do the same with misinformation? When you expose people to just a, a weakened dose of it, weak enough, people are not duped by it, but strong enough to, to, to trigger the production of cognitive antibodies, uh, can people become more immune? If you warn them in advance, if you give them a, a slight piece of the misinformation uh, and you provide people with the counter arguments they need to protect themselves from it in advance, can people build up immunity or resistance? And that's what we've been working on. And it's, it's all about the prevention metaphor. Prevention is better than cure. It circumvents the continued influence of misinformation problem. Uh, it circumvents lots of the other problems you have with the other approaches because you're getting there first and you're proactively protecting people. And that's kind of what we've been doing. And um, the way that we've tried to scale this, because scalability is, is also an issue, is that instead of pre-bunking or inoculating uh, against very specific myths, which you can do, so you could inject people uh, with the facts beforehand or with a weakened dose beforehand, let's say on climate change, we've done that before, it, it works. But you can't pre-bunk every single issue. And so, I mean, you, you could certainly try, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to do. Uh, and what we've been doing is trying to scale this up at the technique level. So we've been trying to expose people to the general techniques that are used in the production of all misinformation, uh, polarization, conspiracy theories. Uh, this includes things like echo chambers and false amplification, um, impersonating fake experts, uh, the use of emotions to manipulate people, fear-mongering, kind of these general manipulation techniques. Um, and we found that if you can inoculate people against those techniques, then people can look at specific news and recognize, oh, they're trying to polarize me. Ooh, this is a conspiracy theory. Um, and that's what we've been testing over the years, and that's what we found through, you know, we've tried to implement this in fun ways through games and animated videos and, uh, and different ways to try to, you know, reach millions of people around the world. And that's kind of what... Uh, what we've been implementing uh, um, and so far. And so far we found that pre-bunking works pretty well. Um, we've been kind of using the viral analogy that it works best when you're truly PM preemptive, like prophylactic, right? Um, but there's an incubation period of the misinformation virus. Uh, so it's, you know, you can still have therapeutic benefits uh, when people have been already exposed to the misinformation, but it's not been years like the, you know, the MMR vaccine or the, the autism sort of, um, um, uh, tragedy, you know, where it took years to retract the false uh, paper in the Lancet that linked autism to uh, uh, vaccines. And if it sits for years, then, you know, you're just debunking. Uh, but there is a period in between where you can still pre-bunk. Uh, and this is kind of a timeline between pre-bunking and, and, and debunking. Uh, and so when it, when it comes after, it's, it's kind of a therapeutic pre-bunk where it's more like an antibiotic drop, right? Where you're still trying to treat people uh, halfway through. Um, and so um, that's kind of what we found. And, you know, it works pretty well. We find that it helps people spot fake news better. They become more confident in their own abilities to discern fact from fiction, and they report to share less fake news. But just with regular, as with natural immunity to COVID or some vaccines, the effects do taper off over time. So sometimes people need a booster shot, right, to, to up their cognitive immunity. Um, and so they need to sort of re-engage with, uh, uh, with the intervention. Uh, and, and the way we've tried to do it is all in a very non-political, non-elitist way, because as you said, um, we don't want the people who need it the most to, to disengage with our intervention. And so we've, we've tried to create fun scenarios where people from all ideologies kind of feel comfortable. Uh, and so we, we, t we tend to simulate social media environments to make it more realistic. Uh, and then we expose people in a social media simulation to weaken doses of these techniques and let them figure things out on their own by taking the perspective of 
of the bad guy. I'm not sure if you've tried one of them, but one's called Bad News. It's kind of a general one. Then we have Harmony Square, which was done with the U.S. government, and it, it's, it's about political misinformation. And then we have Go Viral, which we did with the cabinet office in the U.K. and the WHO and the U.N., and that's about COVID. Um, but the philosophy is always the same. We allow people to step into the shoes of the, the magician of the dark arts uh, in an attempt to inoculate them against the, uh, against it. And I think, you know, so I love to quote Severus Snape from the Harry Potter novels. Uh, our approach must be as flexible and inventive as the arts that we seek to undo. So that's why we kind of came up with the idea of pre-bunking. <laughs> okay, so let's talk now about evidence and science communication, because now in this particular pandemic context, I think it's particularly relevant and also fake news in the realm of science. So when it comes to science communication, what would you say are some of the most common mistakes made by science communicators? Yeah, I think one of the most common mistakes made include the idea that it's just about facts and just about debunking. And so I think often what we've been advising news journalists and science um, communicators is that there is a lot of value in, in pre-bunking. And it, it's such a radical shift in their thinking because it means that you'd have to write an article to proactively warn people about some form of misinformation uh, in a clever way that's going to not spread the misinformation further, right? But 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 actually helps people identify it. Um, and that's you know an interesting way because often what we do is all reactive. Misinformation comes out, and we we tell social media platforms the same thing. Fact checkers on social media platforms. Misinformation hits social media. Everyone's panicking. What do we do? We try to then debunk. Instead, we could have pro proactively. Uh, as science communicators, try to inoculate people so that when it actually happens, they're they're already immune and the misinformation virus won't have a chance to spread. So that's that's one ingredient. Um, but then there are other things, especially around COVID, where where there are difficult things that that are not clearly fake news, right? Um, there is information on risks and benefits about vaccines that people need to understand correctly. So when it comes to let's say the blood clot issue of the AstraZeneca vaccine. There are misperceptions and misinterpretations of, of what the risks are, um, but that's not the same as, as nefarious disinformation, right? Um, and so how do you communicate risks and evidence to people uh, in a way that helps people understand it better um, and not leads to, to, to you know, potential misinformation? And we've, we have an article in Nature that we call Five Rules for Evidence Communication, and we, we try to come up with these five tips. So the first tip we already talked about, which is pre-bunking, uh, pre-bunk any misconceptions. If you're a science communicator, the first thing you should do is pre-bunk any misconceptions people might have on the issue. The second is, um, you know, you have to portray balance, um, but not false balance. You know, so now, on climate change, most scientists agree that climate change is happening, so you shouldn't be pretending that there is disagreement in the scientific community, right? Um, but when it comes to vaccinations, there are benefits and risks that people need to know about, right? And the benefits seems to outweigh the risks. And so um, you have to tell that story in a way that helps people make better decisions. So you want to put the risks in context for people. For example, that only a tiny percentage of people experience side effects uh, and always talk to your doctor and so on. Uh, but then also talk about the, the benefits of, of vaccines. And we find that when you respect the anxieties and the risks and the concerns that people have who are hesitant, not spreaders of disinformation, just people who are hesitant because they're not sure, when you respect and listen to their concerns and address it by um, communicating the risks and benefits in an understandable way, it, it, it reduces the sort of political and social reactions that you often see. So that's balance. Then there's um, uncertainty. So we recommend talking about uncertainty. I think one of the big things that's wrong with science and the way we talk about it is that we pretend everything's 100% certain, right? Uh, even when the efficacy of the vaccine, and this is very controversial because science communicators would say, don't say this because you're going to make people more hesitant about the vaccine. We have to be honest and say, look, uh, if it says 90% efficacy, it's not one number, right? It's a, it's, it's, there's uncertainty around that number. Uh, it could be... Uh, 84%, it could be 95%, but 90% is the average. But we want to be honest about the range so that you don't come in thinking that it's 100% effective, even when we say 97%, right? We find in our experiments that people are absolutely fine with that. 
their trust in your message doesn't decrease uh, because you've been honest about variation and uncertainty. In fact, um, they feel a bit less hostile towards your communication because you're being more, more honest. Now, th this issue of transparency about data and uncertainty is very, very tricky because you do not want to confuse people. Um, a lot of people worry that people don't understand confidence intervals, they don't understand how, how numbers work. I think if you do this in a way that's easy to interpret, so you tell people, you know, in context, um, there is a bit of uncertainty about what we know and what we don't know. And this is true for scientific findings too, right? Uh, Pre-bunking isn't some magical cure. Um, you know, there's uncertainty about uh, the efficacy of our interventions, as with any interventions, and we want to make sure we communicate that clearly to people. I think that that is the best way to enhance long-term trust in the scientific enterprise rather than short-term persuasion uh, of, of behavior change. But sometimes it's very necessary during a public health crisis. But in the end, we want to maintain long-term trust in science. So I think flagging uncertainty about scientific findings is very important. Um, and a good way, I think, to do it is to talk about the weight of the evidence. So um, you might say that a single study, you know, people shouldn't put their faith in a single study. You know, uh, one study says, oh, you shouldn't drink a glass of wine while you're pregnant. The other study says, oh, it, it doesn't harm you and might even benefit you. Um, you want to look at, as a science communicator, you want to portray the weight of the evidence for people. You want to say, I'm a science communicator. If you look at the hundreds of studies that are out there, here's where the weight of the evidence is. So you want to help people uh, and say there's a bit of uncertainty, but, but here's where the, the bulk of the evidence is. Um, and so that, those are uh, some of the uh, ingredients that uh, uh, we've looked at. And the last, uh, the last point I'll say is that the quality of evidence, uh, which is another ingredient for science communities. What is the quality of the evidence? The quality of, of, of papers on COVID-19 has been very low, I can tell you that, on, on preprints without peer review. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's out there that's just of low quality. So when we do experiments, and we do experiments on how people make judgments about evidence a lot, and one of the things is that if you don't tell them what the quality of the evidence is for a given intervention, people think it's high automatically, uh, which is not good if it's actually low. So some of the work, uh, we just have to be honest and say, look, we, uh, you know, uh, experiments have been done, whether, whether it's about uh, public health intervention or the physical science. You say, your yeah, experiment has been done. We're just, uh, the quality of the evidence is still developing. Uh, it's not at the stage of a double-blind randomized trial. Um, but there are some interesting findings here. And so, you, you know, you include the quality of the evidence, the uncertainty. And I think, you know, a lot of people are scared that people will interpret this incorrectly and it will erode people's trust and they won't change their behavior. We, in our experiments, we mostly find that people are okay with it, you know. Um, it, it is not uh, enhancing people's trust in you. They're not saying, oh, thank you for, for being so... Uh, so honest, unfortunately, that's also not what people are saying, but for, it, it doesn't seem to do any damage. Uh, and I think it's useful for maintaining long-term trust in the scientific enterprise. So as a science communicator, pre-bunk, emphasize uncertainty, uh, dig into the quality of the evidence, uh, focus on the, the uh, uh, weight of evidence communication. Um, and uh, yeah, th those are some, some, some tips that we hope are useful. Yeah. So, and when facts become politicized, like has happened with this COVID-19 pandemic, is there anything that science, uh, scientists and science communicators can do about it? Yeah, so when a fact has been politicized, you know, whether it's about the efficacy of mask wearing or the state of the, the longevity of a lockdown, um, often you see that the reason why science becomes politicized is because it has political implications for people. Uh, people are not arguing over gravity, okay, uh, because uh, it doesn't have implications for how people lead their lives, on, on, uh, at least not yet, you know. If there's a point where gravity starts telling you how you need to be living your life, I'm sure the science of gravity is going to be polarized, uh, but, but as of now, it's not. Um, and so I think what, what underlies that is a, a distinct reaction to what the science has to say for how people lead their lives. So if you're a science community, think about that. Think about how you could frame it in a way. And some people say, oh, frames are bad because frames are a way to influence people. Uh, but my solution to that is what, what we call ethical persuasion. Uh, and that is uh, be honest with people that you're making a persuasive argument um, so that people can decide whether or not they want to partake in your persuasion attempt. Uh, voluntarily. Um, and that's kind of, you know, the same as, 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 as micro-targeting. I think the big problem is people are not aware they're being targeted online with disinformation or fake news. Uh, um, and so that, that, that's kind of the influence problem. But um, let's go back to the example. 
Um, what we found in our research is that uh, when something is politicized, um, emphasizing that there is a consensus in science can be quite useful. So we don't, for example, in climate change, which is one of the most polarizing topics in the United States, we find that if you tell people, yeah, okay, well, uh, you know, fossil fuel tax and so on, there's polarization. But when you simply tell people that most scientists agree that climate change is real and happening, um, people don't polarize uh, on that issue uh, because it's not directly challenging the, the, the policy implications of it. Uh, and this is what we call a gateway. So you need some sort of gateway. You need a non-threatening, non-sort of direct message to start with. Uh, and this comes all from the realization that what's threatening to people is not the science, but th what the science says for what they need to do with their lives. Uh, and so you need this sort of gateway. Uh, and Bob Cialdini calls something similar, what he calls persuasion. Uh, people are not going to be open to your persuasion if you don't massage them beforehand about what you're about, what you're going to say, right? You want some affirmation, some some common ground uh, to get people ready to to be open, open-minded about what you're going to say. Um, and again, you can do this ethically by by telling people that look, uh, we need to have a conversation about this. Um, and um, Politicization is bad. It's bad. It's becoming polarized, um, and 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 you know, science is is isn't a consensus on uh, on this particular issue. Uh, but we recognize that uh, it has implications for uh, that are political and that are debated. Um, but here's you know why we think there should be bipartisan consensus on it. So you know, try to write it in a way that, that sort of acknowledges this this background because the strategy of just dumping, uh, saying people are stupid. Um, these are the facts. This is what you need to do. I think that doesn't work most of the time with politicized facts. Mm -hmm. And is there any way for science communicators to productively approach science deniers? Yeah, so science deniers is, uh, you know, that's a great question. The, the label is also a bit contested because um, they don't like being called deniers, obviously, uh, because they, they kind of see themselves as truthers, more or less. Uh, um, and so, uh, you know, it's um, it's a good question. Uh, some people have kind of pivot the question and say, how much resources should we spend on trying to convince deniers versus protecting the public from what deniers have to say? Because even though they're a small minority, they can have a big uh, sort of influence. Uh, and you see this with concerted influence campaigns that are conducted on social media to try to influence people. So it's a minority of people, but they can they can harness a lot of resources. Um, you know, we talked about fake news. Uh, most people are not sharing it, uh, for example, but one of the dangers is, is, is that you can micro-target fake news to people on social media. So you can be very specific with your message. Uh, and that's the same what organized denial can do. They can target people very strategically. Uh, and because elections are decided on a few percentage points, very small margins, this is why I think disinformation, fake news, and denial is so, is so important and so consequential. Because even though it's not most people, you only need a tiny fraction of the population to be convinced by your message. And it can have huge, uh, huge consequences. Um, so when you are going to approach deniers, um, and I've had my fair share of interaction with diehard conspiracy theorists uh, over email. Um, I can say that, you know, most things do not work um, um, because they're, they have such an extreme view of the world and are so uh, uh, enthralled in their own kind of worldview that it's very difficult to come back from that. Um, so, you know, here, here's what people have tried. Let me let me let me say that. Mm -hmm. uh, Cass Sunstein has an interesting thing he calls cognitive infiltration, which is you insert yourself into an online chat room of deniers uh, or blog or Reddit forum. You pretend to be one of them and you start subverting from within uh, by inserting doubt and questioning their beliefs and so on, which is a very radical <laughs> type of uh, strategy that I'm not, I'm not sure how ethical it is, but but you know that that's one thing that you that people have done. Um, the other is. Um, called affirmation, so self-affirmation, and there is some, you know, some debate on how effective this is, but there is some research that show that when you first affirm people's worldview, so if you're a science communicator, you're engaging with denial, first affirming people's worldview can be useful, and often people don't want to do this because they're like, I don't want to affirm their worldview of, of I don't know, uh, racism, sexism, hatred, uh, conspiracy theories, science denial, um, but here, here's a practical way that you can do that. Um, 
when I talk to conspiracy theorists, I often begin and say this, look, some conspiracy theories have been real throughout history, you know, they've been uncovered. Some there have been real conspiracy theories, you know, um, uh, see, you know, uh, people conspired on the Senate to stab Caesar because uh, they thought he was gaining too much influence, right? Uh, and so this affirms the idea that you're not ridiculing the idea of a conspiracy, that you're uh, affirming that some conspiracies have real. Then you pivot and say, but look, but this conspiracy about COVID or global warming, that's, that's not real um, because so and so and so. Uh, people feel now less threatened because you've acknowledged uh, their worldview first. Uh, and then you can try to, to correct it. So that's, you know, a, a technique people have tried. Um, I like to, you know, the idea that you need a gateway of some sort, whether it's affirmation or something else, you, you need an in, uh, either by starting with a, a non-threatening sort of uh, sort of validation uh, message. Um, and so that, you know, that is a technique that you can, uh, that you can use. Uh, not labeling them deniers, I think, in the article is, is tends, tends to be useful. Um, and, uh, you know, there's the balance between you don't want to give legitimacy to these type of ideas either because they can be dangerous. Uh, but at the same time, if you want your message to speak to that audience, you have to engage with them a little bit uh, on on their own terms, uh, at least. And I think that's the that's the tricky part because people are often uh, not not willing to uh, to do that uh, uh, because, for example, imagine that you write something about vaccines saying like, oh yeah, you know, there were some issues with big pharma and so on and so. Then the deniers could take your article if you're a credible epidemiologist, a credible public health expert and say, oh look, this public health expert, he's calling out the big pharma conspiracy and you know, so and we're right and so on. They could just use it as, as ammunition uh, in, their, in their campaign. And that's, I think, what people are concerned about doing that. And I think it's a legitimate concern. So it's, it's, it's very tricky um, how you actually go about doing this. I don't think there's a proven method of, of interacting with deniers at all. I think there's, there's no, no intervention that has seen incredible success. And I think it's just because they're so far down the rabbit hole that it's, 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 it's very difficult. And the question is, should we spend any resources on it? Um, so I, I do think there's some use to engaging with them. And the best thing you can do is, is to, to try not to antagonize their, their worldview. Um, uh, and again, you know, it's, it's, it's simple things. I had a conspiracy theorist email me obsessively about the fact that, that um, there's a conspiracy that Shakespeare didn't write his own sonnets. Uh, and, and, and he was convinced that there's a conspiracy in science and that we're all crazy and that we're covering it up. And, you know, one of the things I do is like I said, you know, look, obviously you're a brilliant scholar. You know, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to email me. I understand your concerns. You know, I see that you've deeply researched this. I hear your concerns that the people are not recognizing the scientific community is not willing to publish you. Um, but, um, and then you go on to say something a bit more critical. Uh, and that seems to diffuse uh, a lot of the attention. People that I talk to are not willing to start a conversation like that with a denier of, of this kind. And I think that's the, that remains the, the challenge because you have to recognize their humanity on some level. Um, and uh, we're now so polarized that that becomes an issue. Even when you talk about, let's say, Republicans and Democrats, people you know, less a, fa a factor of polarization. So people are less willing to marry people from the other side. They're less willing to even talk to them. So how are you going to reach consensus, bipartisan consensus on COVID or any other issue if you don't even want to talk uh, or, or listen to what the other side has to say? And I think that's the that's the problem. So some intellectual humility uh, that we could all probably benefit from is, is going to be part of the solution. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we don't want to legitimize dangerous worldviews. Um, so that's that's the fine line. And I'm not sure if there was any any useful practical tips in there, Ricardo, but but that's kind of my sidestepping your question. Yeah, I mean, but if I mean, if it's really hard, it's a really hard question. And I mean, I guess that also the science behind these kinds of questions is not that well developed yet. So, uh, I mean, uh, let, uh, now talking specifically about the coronavirus and the strategies we know uh, work against it, against its spread, like, for example, wearing masks, social distancing, staying at home, etc. Uh, do you think that governments and health authorities could have done better in terms of how they communicated about these strategies? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there could have been room for improvement uh, by taking into account some of the lessons of science communication. So when you know 
that uh, government restrictions are going to antagonize, you know, certain segments of society because of their political views. You can think of ways of framing the message that's going to resonate better with that kind of audience. Um, and so one of the biggest lessons in communication is, is that, um, you know, uh, know your audience, right? Uh, tailor your message uh, to the values of the people that you're speaking to. And so I think that that is something that could have been done better. The whole mask issue with the WHO was, was uh, I think, a disaster in terms of uh, the, the reasons that were given initially, the, the developing signs of the efficacy of masks. I think that whole message uh, should have been different and, and more explicit. And I, still to this day, I don't think people understand, some people don't understand why they need to wear a mask. And so, you know, I see lots of people, you know, wearing the mask down at their chin, you know, they're, they're, and it's like, I, you know, it's just that it's been communicated so terribly, like what the point of the mask is that, that sometimes people don't, sometimes people just don't understand it and sometimes people don't want to. And I think those are two different motivations and we need to have different solutions for, for, for these kinds of motivations. Um, um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, Again, one tip for science communicators is use in-group, uh, prototypical in-group influencers. So um, if you want support from, uh, you know, people on the extreme right, uh, to, you know, for, for government intervention or, or mandating uh, masks or vaccines, get prominent people in those communities uh, to spread the message. Because who do people listen to? Not, not always some, some external authority. Uh, um, although we do find that people are more receptive to, let's say, independent scientists than the government, um, uh, they're going to be even more susceptible to a member of the group that they respect and view as their, uh, uh, as their fellow citizen. Uh, and so there could have been more, more of that, you know, and, and, and one of the papers um, that we put out early during the pandemic, we, we, we gave one of the lessons that, that have been uh, uh, developed in developing countries. Uh, have religious community leaders go and advocate science-based messages because religious community leaders in some countries are the people that are respected and listened to. Um, and so, you know, instead of putting putting talking heads of, of, of people that, that people don't care about on TV, uh, get people to talk about those things in their respective communities. Um, if you want more trust in, in vaccines in uh, minority communities, uh, who have issues with trust uh, with government and health authorities because of bad things that have happened to them in the past, um, you know, um, engage prominent members of those communities to disseminate your message. And I think that can be that can be quite useful. Uh, one of my favorite examples is Arnold Schwarzenegger on the issue of climate change, uh, right? He um, engages different kinds of audiences. He engages the, 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 the kind of macho man audience by saying, look, you can have big muscles and still be a vegetarian. Uh, it's cool to be a vegetarian. Uh, he can talk about, look, you don't need to believe in climate change. We all like clean energy, uh, so on. During COVID, he said, look, we need to listen to the scientists. You know, I'm a, I'm a Republican. I listen to the scientists. Uh, and so uh, you need people uh, like that to be useful vehicles. I think that's one big lesson from science communication. Uh, and that feeds into, you know, tailor your, your message to the audience. And then I think there's just lessons about evidence communication and how to present numbers and evidence in a way that helps people digest it and make better informed decisions based on transparent communication. And, you know, we've talked through all of those lessons about uncertainty and quality of evidence. And um, we work on designing, you know, graphics in different ways to, to try to represent evidence that helps people make better decisions because it can be very complicated. One study says this, the other study says that, the WO, WHO says this, CDC says that, Trump says this. Um, it, it gets very chaotic. And so you need a better way of condensing the evidence, the weight of the evidence for people. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any relevant cultural differences in terms of how people were susceptible to misinformation about COVID-19? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, we, we've done some international research on, on this and we found that um, Pretty much people in a variety of countries, whether it's Ireland or Mexico or Spain or the United States, um, you know, when people endorse misinformation, there, there was a link, an association, so that, so that people were less likely to then, you know, willing to intend to, to get the vaccine, for example, and that was true in all countries. Um, the types of, of inf misinformation that people endorse differed slightly, so for example, Actually, we saw we saw the highest endorsement of the fact that COVID was a bioweapon made in a lab in, in uh, I think, in Mexico, uh, rather than, uh, let's say, the UK. 
Um, so there were some some differences in you know in the extent to which people endorsed misinformation specifically uh, in specific stories, but overall this link was was pretty robust. Um, but there have been interesting uh, differences. So you know the 5G has been prominent in the UK. People have been burning down phone masks, particularly in the UK, on on the issue that you know 5G somehow exacerbates COVID-19. Uh, whereas there's you know different kinds of of issues that are happening elsewhere. And I think in Iran, uh, people have been ingesting methane as a cure for the coronavirus. And so that's a very non-political one, right? That's that's just about fake cures, for example. And so I do think you see slight cultural differences in, in what kind of misinformation is, is taking priority for people. Um, and also more generally, if you look at North America, Canada, well, I don't want to start a polarizing debate here about commonalities and differences between Canada and the United States, uh, but let me say that Canada, in some ways, similar to the United States, um, but their approach to COVID-19 radically different. Whereas their neighbor is hugely polarized on the issue, Canada has reached bipartisan consensus on a lot of COVID-19 policies. So how is that possible when the two countries are so close together? So I think that the internal culture does play a role. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, just going back a little bit to a topic that you talked about earlier in the interview, inoculation against misinformation, does this inoculation have long-term effects? Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, inoculation, um, the, the initial theory was that you need some time for the inoculation to take effect. And so the initial theory was that when you inject people with the weakened dose, they need a few days to build up the resistance. Uh, but it turns out that's not really the case. You, you give people the antidote or the, the weakened dose of the vaccine, it works pretty much immediately, but then actually in the case, it tapers off over time. That's what you see. It doesn't get stronger over time. It actually reduces over time. Uh, and that's something that we've been researching. And what we find is that, um, you know, it, it depends on the type of inoculation, what vehicle you're using. So if we use a message, a science communication message, you know, we've done a, a one-week follow-up once, and we found that, you know, the effect was still there after one week, so that's pretty good. Uh, we also have games. Those are like 20, 25-minute social media simulations, right? It's much more intense. Uh, and then what's interesting is that when we followed up with people, so, the, so the, it depended on the design of the experiment, but in one group, we followed up with people week after week. And so we attacked people with misinformation week after week to see if, if they're still immune. And what we found initially was that it wasn't it wasn't declining. So so people were still immune, you know, uh, after after two three months. And we thought, yeah, that's not really possible. Like, what's going on here? And so we we redid the experiment, and what we found is that and this time, we only followed up with people at the end of the three month period, not in between. And then we found that the effect was still positive, but it was significantly reduced. And so it did decay over time. And so we started hypothesizing. In fact, what we're doing in between in this other experiment, we're boosting people in between by making them alert about the risk of misinformation, by getting people to retrieve the lessons that they've learned in their head. Um, and so what we found is that if you boost people regularly, you can maintain immunity for at least a couple of months. If you don't, it, it, you know, it, it decays uh, over time. Uh, and we don't have a a formal function for how to explain the rate of the decay over time. That's something we're currently working on. Um, but it's not simple linear. And so it's it, it's more complex. Um, but it, the short answer is that, yes, uh, it declines over time. But the positive thing is that you can boost it. Uh, uh, and we don't know, you know what, what the ultimate period is. It's not like a biological vaccine. You're not going to get lifelong immunity, right? Um, but we can do some, some positive things with it. And ultimately, you know, COVID, uh, natural immunity wears off over time too for COVID, and we don't know exactly when and how long that occurs too. So the, the analogy is, is is fascinating to me. Um, but yeah, that's that's what's happening. Um, the last thing I'll say is that um, what we think is useful is, is this contact, this this um, idea of active inoculation. So passive inoculation is when you provide the counter arguments and the refutations in advance for people, and they read it. Active inoculation is that you let people do it themselves. You come into our simulation, you do your own work, you create your own antibodies by engaging with the content. And because you're actively engaging the brain, we think that it may last longer uh, because of the active method. And that's something we're currently trying to uh, figure out. Uh, uh, having said that, you know, with the viral analogy, psychological immunity is also not at the same efficacy level as biological immunity. We're not talking about 90% efficacy, right? We're talking more, you know, it's difficult to quantify this because effect sizes and statistics and 
and people wanting a percentage are not exactly the same thing, but if we're forced to make an estimate, we usually say that we're boosting people's ability about 30% uh, in terms of their improved score, uh, which is a lot different than you know 90 percent, but because um, I think you're all, you're also fighting political and social motivations and things like that. But if we can get people to be you know 30 percent more immune uh, for a certain amount of time, then we can start to calculate how many millions of people need to be inoculated at what level to to get herd immunity. Because that's for me that's the ultimate driving home the ultimate idea behind the metaphor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just one last question, and going all the way back to the beginning of our conversation, uh, do you think that social media represent generally a net positive or a net negative for people's lives and particularly their access to information? Wow, that's a that's a that's a difficult that's a difficult <laughs> question. Um, you know, I. I started on, so I, you know, the first platform I ever had was MySpace back in the day, I'm old. Uh, and so, you know, um, then it was Facebook and Twitter and I don't keep up with the TikTok and, uh, and Instagram. I do have an account, right? But, but, but um, it, um, I think the evolution of it has been fast, a lot faster. If you look at satur market saturation, it's happened within, you know, less than a decade that most people uh, have access to social media, whereas with radio and TV and even the internet, it was much slower. People psychologically, we had more time to test it. We had more time for people to get used to it. So I think what's happened here is is a an attack on our psychology that's been really rapid, and we haven't figured out yet what that means. Um, what are the benefits? I can keep in touch with people. I'm a, a psychological scientist who works with social media companies and people who who. Uh, read your or listen to your podcast should know that, that you know I'm, I'm sometimes funded by social media companies but I also criticize them actively um, and I'm sure that sometimes they think you're a scientist who uses Twitter so you must see, see, see some use uh, in social media uh, as a platform I do use it I think it's useful to connect people to stay in touch with people uh, people can find support on social media you can spread good messages fast efficiently think about humanitarian efforts um, I've done research on viral prosociality on the internet. You can connect billions of people fast and make donations and and get you know uh, get people to do online um, um, activism uh, in the sense of providing internet to conflict places where people are not able to express themselves. So yeah, I mean there's there's tons of benefits of of social media. Um, there's also tons of of bad stuff happening now, echo chambers, filter bubbles, disinformation, um, uh, negative effects on, on mental health, on, on well-being, on people's self-esteem, uh, on, you know, possibly people becoming, yeah, I know researchers don't like the term addiction, but, you know, some, some people spend a lot of time on the internet. Um, it, it, it can harm people, you know, if people become radicalized on the internet and on social media in particular. Um, there's just general negative incentives. Uh, there's no, there's little accountability of these companies. Uh, they're taking up more and more uh, market share. People are being targeted without their knowledge. Uh, and I think there, there are some real issues with uh, co companies experimenting on people and not being transparent about what they're doing uh, and uh, facilitating in unintended ways hate speech and racism. Um, the list, the list is getting very long of the negatives. I think uh, in comparison to the positives. I think there was a time. Maybe you know we can think of it as a way of, of uh, uh, a point in time. I think there was a point in time that uh, social media, where the net benefits were outweighing the the net uh, negatives. I think we're now heading into a period where maybe the net negatives are outweighing the net positives on society, on democracy, on elections. Uh, and and I think we need to think faster and harder uh, about what we can do to try to maintain a positive net benefit because ultimately I don't think the technology in itself is necessarily bad or good I think it's technology is always neutral it's how people interact with it and how we use it um, so I think there could be a net positive benefit um, and what that requires in my opinion is a massive rethinking of the incentives on social media which means Social media companies don't profit off of advertising. They don't profit off of um, engagement, which comes from harmful content. They've pretty much admitted 
the, the stuff that gets most traction, most engagement is the polarizing stuff, the conspiracy theories, the novel stuff that gets people riled up, click more, share more. That's where they're getting uh, the most engagement. That's where they're getting the money from. A lot of measures are implemented in such a way that it addresses the problem without risking decreasing engagement. Now, if you can find a solution like that, fine. But I think uh, the, the business model is the problem, the, the whole business model. So we need to, to rethink it. I'm not sure. I didn't, the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, I think there were some interesting things about it. It was a bit critical. But I do like this one saying that people forget that you're not paying for this social media service, which means that you are the product. Um, and I think we forget that we are all the product uh, when we go online. And that business model is not good. Should people pay for social media? I don't know. Is it nice to have to, to give people a platform for free that they can use to connect people? You know, this is the argument that Facebook brings. You know, we did we don't want to deplatform people um, because how can you how can you build revolutions of social change if, if if small groups without money don't have a platform? Um, I think it's a false dichotomy. You could still platform those people and deplatform the bad people who are spreading disinformation and hate speech and, and so on, right? Um, so at the end of the day, I think it, social media needs a radical overhaul in terms of how the business model works. If we do that, I think we can have net positive gains uh, versus the, uh, uh, the, the, the negative sort of side effects we're seeing now. Uh, to summarize, I think there was a time where the positives were outweighing the negatives. I think we're now in an era where the negatives are increasingly starting to outweigh the positives, even though we're all using social media. Again, this was a terribly long-winded answer. I don't know for the end of the show, you just wanted me to say one thing, uh, but I think that's that's pretty much how I think about it. Yeah, great. So let's end on that note. Just before we go, where can people find your work on the internet? Yeah, uh, people can uh, uh, find uh, my work on the Cambridge Psychology website. Uh, if you just Google, uh, you know, Vanderlyn Psychology, uh, they can find it there. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Sander underscore VD Linden. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Um, and you can also uh, engage with our interventions, uh, Bad News, for example. Uh, and you can follow uh, the book that's about to come out next year, hopefully the truth vaccine that I'm working on. Um, so hopefully that gives people some ideas of where to find me. Okay, great. So let me leave again uh, an invitation on the table for you to come back on the show next year to talk <laughs> about the book. And it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure is mine. Thanks, Ricardo. Ricardo. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been doing the channel for more than three years now. And it is thanks to people like you that it's been running for so long. And so if you like what I'm doing, please pay a visit to my Patreon page or to PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of the interview. And to consider making a pledge there, support the show. And otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share, share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enrique Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, George Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Yevon Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Sam, uh, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araujo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londoño Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Miran B., Nicole Barbaro, 
Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Max Bailby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Alan or uh, Al Horowitz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Kian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Venegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardus France, and Niroban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.